Welcome to another Juniper Network sponsored webinar. Today we'll have a Juniper expert talk about measuring the business impact of virtualization. In addition, we have a very special guest from NEC Netcracker. This is another part to a webinar series that Juniper has hosted on transformation management. We've covered solutions that matter. We've also had a business transformation guide to stay differentiated. Also, the SDN and NFE to empower your technology transformation, followed by the organization of the future to transform your NFE service delivery. Lastly, today our focus is on how to measure the business impact of virtualization, which I think you'll find very, very interesting. So I'd like to spend a minute today to introduce today's presenters. I'm, I'm your host, Wayne Chung, Director of Product Marketing for NFE at Juniper Networks. I'd like to introduce our esteemed colleagues today. Um, first is Sri Kanabal, uh, Senior Product Ma Marketing at Juniper Networks. Sri? Thanks, Wayne. Hi, my name is Sri Kanabal. I am Senior Product Marketing Manager in the Business Analysis Group. Today I'll be talking about business case for virtualizing physical network. In particular, we'll talk about various economic drivers that lead to improved financials of cloud CPE. Thank you, Sri. And our other speaker is um, Ari Banerjee from NEC, Senior Director of Strategy. Welcome, Sh welcome, Ari. Hey, thanks, Wayne. Um, so my name is Ari Banerjee. I'm a Senior Director of Strategy for uh, for NEC Netracker, and I look at the overall portfolio go-to-market strategy, uh, both which involves our uh, traditional billing and OSS assets as well as SDN and FE. Great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Let's walk through our agenda for today. Shree will cover off the centralized cloud CPE business model. Then Ari will walk through the virtual CPE enterprise segment as they see it with NEC experiences. And then we'll close with the collaborative journey of how to move this forward. And now we'll bring on Shree who will walk us through the centralized cloud CPE business model. Hi, thank you, Wayne. My name is Shri, and today we'll be looking at quantifying the business impact for cloud centralized cloud CPE. We will look at the strategic value of cloud-based managed services. We will compare it against the alternative hardware-based solution. We'll also look at how that can be prioritized among internal projects. We will also look at what is required for creating a business model like that, various inputs regarding market, cost drivers, and forecasting methodologies. We will look at the results from the financial impacts, the metrics like ROI, NPV. We'll look at the financial statements, and also have a quick peek at the real options. But the essence of today's session is that we, we want to consider all the factors, not necessarily just the numbers, but various data input needed, how do we measure it, and validate our assumptions. A model is only as good as the inputs and assumptions are. So we will look at the, spend much of the time looking at the assumptions. And one of the critical things about um, having a business analysis and business case is it's also used as a communication tool. We talk about various aspects and viability of a project, but we'll also have an opportunity to bring in various other parts of the organization, like CMO, which are customers and Salesforce facing, organization, they will have a view about the solutions and their branding and their you know, trying new services uh, in the market. So their approach will be to fail fast, learn the lessons, move on to the next service. And we'll also, we'll also look at how to bring in CFO organization into the picture. They are interested in reducing the business risk, trying out new business models. And so we'll look at how you know, we can bring in, communicate across all these organizations and present it as a single integrated view. In this business case, we assume it's an average service provider, and we'll make some reasonable and conservative estimates about our assumptions. Also assume that you know, it is across the geographies. But the idea is to use the representation for each decision factor and show that there is an inherent advantage in our virtualization solution. The key is to validate these assumptions. Now we will look at the Cloud CPE business model overview itself. So if we look at the today's traditional hardware-based appliance, the process involved 
is a very high-touch model. It includes manual ordering, inventorying, activation, um, billing and setup. All these processes are manual, which implies it's a high cost to serve model. And the geography is also very restricted because of managed van facility, and the truck roll has to be sent to provision and troubleshoot. This reduces our total addressable market. The delivery time is long because of truck roll involved and configuration of each hardware and the network. So service flexibility itself is rigid because you need to have a hardware back box per functionality, and you may have to configure and reconfigure other components. So all these will make a, a traditional business model inflexible. Now, if you look at the future of the cloud CPE, the promises are that it will be a low touch and no touch, in fact, zero touch model, where you know the cost of serving becomes lower. And then we can start using internet, means geography becomes unrestricted. It increases our total addressable market. And because there will be no truck roll, it reduces the delivery time. And flexibility is based on software delivery, and we'll have immense flexibility from that point of view. Now we will look at the revenue opportunity in the market. SMB market is a prime target for cloud CPE managed services because SMB market was underserved because it was not cost effective to serve the SMB market so far. They, are, they were underserved. If you look at the left-hand side chart, due to the, the forecast is that due to the attractiveness of cloud features, the expectation is to have a greater adoption of cloud CPE, approximately around 10.6% as opposed to appliance-based growth at 5%. That is the forecast for the cloud CPE uh, managed services. Now, in this business case, we will look at the man, uh, managed security services regarding uh, VPN, firewall and overlay services, IPS and application security, antivirus, anti-spam, and content filtering. These are the four separate services offered on Cloud CPE. In addition, there can be more services as well, like wireless LAN, VAN optimization, SD-VAN, machine-to-machine, IoT, and other services are possible, easily possible, but it's not part of the today's business case uh, numbers. However, we will set up an infrastructure up front to enable those services later on. Now we will look at the methodology of business case and what kind of insight can we gain from developing a business model. Now in our methodology, we will look at the inputs where we consider various regional data. If available, it can be from a primary market research or secondary from a government website and others. We'll also look at and we can use industry benchmarks, like for example, say, what's the average salary of a full-time engineer, that kind of information from the industry benchmarks. Or all of that can be overridden by customer input as the input. So ultimately, the customer can you know, have their input, what they see as their experience, what is realistic for them, that is used as the input. And the next part, part of that is financial modeling, where we'll look at three different aspects. On the revenue side, we will look at new services or new markets and use those factors to determine what is the revenue projection for the next few years of service. The second side of that is the cost side. We will look at various CapEx or OpEx side, see where the uh, operational savings can come from, if can we use the shared infrastructure to reduce cost, use those cost drivers to model the cost projections. And the third part is where we set up infrastructure today, but then we, decide, we have an option to decide to pursue that path or not. So that flexibility or that optionality has a value, and that is called real options value. We'll discuss briefly about that, and we, will, we have not modeled that in for this today's session, but that can be a good value as well. And all of these are used to project or come out with the output for the, for the next few years, like financial statements like income statement or the P&L that shows various different margins. We'll look at the business balance sheet that shows what are the equipment assets at a given point of time, and the cash flow in and cash flow out. All this shows 
how does the financial viability looks in the most likely scenario. But what if our scenario, our assumptions, what if they now do not hold good? So we want to kind of look at various scenarios and assess our risk and put in some risk mitigation into our product evaluation. So we will look at that aspect as well. Now we will look at the same methodology, but how do we compare present mode of operation against future mode of operation? We want to bring out the difference between the two. And we do that by, for the revenue side of the picture, we look at the new services, new customers, and maybe increase in traffic, and use that with the assumptions and create a revenue side of the model and project the forecast the revenue. Similarly, for the CapEx side, we will look at various architectural choices, like is it a cloud delivery, or is it hardware-based delivery, or in some cases, is there a layer collapse, and is there a shared infrastructure, and use that to, to model out the hardware cost or depreciation cost, or can we also use to, to kind of compute software cost or amortization or OPEX cost for those. Thirdly, we also look at the operational design, look at the workflow documentation, see what kind of processes and workflow is involved, and, assume, and utilize the degree of automation in each one of those workflow steps and come up with direct operating expense or indirect operating expense. We will, the last part piece of that is uh, assess the optionality and the flexibility of value. This is like, now imagine you have, in an oil and mining industry, you put in an infrastructure, a big machine, to dig into the earth to bring out oil. You don't pump all of the oil in the first phase itself. You will bring out only when you need it. But you'll put in upfront infrastructure to do that at a later point of time. So you have done the initial investment, but you have the option to dig it or now or later. So it has a value, and that value can also be uh, computed. So the options you have is like scale up or scale down, depending on how the market reacts. Or you can scope up your product lines are down based on how the market reaction is. So that is the real options value. However, we have not modeled for today's session, but it is of an immense value as well. Now we will come to the assumptions of the managed security services model itself. A model output is only as good as its assumptions. So validating the assumptions is the key part. So one of the first set of assumptions we have is about the existing customer base. Generally, most of the service providers have already been offering these services, so they have an existing customer base. However, it may not be true as well. It can be a greenfield. But if you are a service provider with an existing customer base, you have a choice. You can either continue to do the same as you have been doing, that is, utilize traditional hardware-based appliance, business as usual. You put in one box for each functionality, one for CPE, one for a firewall, and one more for RAN acceleration similarly. However, if you take an alternative path, which is an exclusive path, you are con contemplating on this new Cloud C project, and if you were to go that path, you have an option. You, you choose to cap the hardware-based service you will not grow it anymore. Any new service will go on cloud CPE. And in addition, the assumption is also that you will either migrate them or allow it for attrition. You know, When it comes for the refresh or end of life, customer can choose to migrate over to cloud CPE. In this business case, we are assuming that that period of migration or attrition is over three years. Next set of assumption is about the market. This is based on the Eurostat data for the European countries, and also North American SBA, Small Business Administration data, it approximately comes in that segmentation. Small business with less than 50 users, around 80%. In fact, the, as, you know, the secondary research shows that it's around 95 or 97%. But if you exclude some of the very small customers as a micro enterprise and do not consider those, we can assume that around 80% are small business. Medium business is around 15%. Um, users between 15 to 50. Large business greater than 250 users on 5%. That's the assumptions we have made. These are all configurable. Uh, however, that's what is used for the calculation. This is a centralized cloud CP architecture where the network functions run in a central location, like a data center or a pop, not at the premise of the customer. 
CPE Cloud device is assumed to be SRX300 with a JSP license for the software. Four security services are used on the VSRX, using the VSRX license. Managed VPN, firewall and overlay, IPS and application security, antivirus and content filtering services. Next set of assumptions is about the NFV infrastructure. So here, you know, um, we are making assumptions about the operation support systems and business support system, the integration cost. We have used it at five million or approximately around five million dollars. And I think there are various factors involved in coming up with that estimate, and it would be a, it would be good to get input from our uh, guest speaker today, Ari, about that. Ari, what do you think should be some of the factors that our customers should you know, look at making a choice on the or validation of these costs? Hey, thanks, Shri. I think it's a it's a very very critical point when you look at uh, commercializing SDN and FV. Uh, one of the key bottlenecks that comes out, and we see that over and over again, is attributed to the uh, the BSS and the OSS systems, right? Um, again, when you look at the integration cost um, of that, um, it can vary depending on how modern your BSS OSS systems are, how much customization has been done on that, um, and um, how you know cloud enabled um, the you know those systems are. How can it support cloud based business models? Um, does it have the right catalog in place to manage not only your physical network functions and stuff that they've already done, but extend that to manage things like um, VNFs? Um, when you think about fulfillment, um, how does that take care of uh, a hybrid infrastructure which manages the PNF side and the VNF? So there are different aspects to it, which depends on how modern your systems are, how future-looking that were, uh, what was the refresh cycle and all of that. So it can vary um, in different directions based on where, um, you know, where the operator systems currently are. So. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Harry. I think that makes sense because I think they are all at different stages, and depending on their individual circumstance, it can be either just $2 million or $5 million or maybe even more than that. But for the argument's sake, we have used $5 million today. Yeah. Now the and uh, as you can imagine, you know, one of the things which um, which also comes up is um, how um, how flexible and how loosely coupled your your systems are. I mean, as we know that in the past, there's a lot of billing and OSS, which was a very monolithic type of a systems. As time went by, it has started to become much more loosely coupled, where integration of that is much more you know, simpler because, you know, you might have followed the DevOps model, you might have followed, uh, you know, the microservices kind of an architecture. So it all depends on some of those variables as well. So, Excellent. Yes, I think that totally makes sense. Yep. So another assumption, uh, no, not necessarily assumption, but the way it has been structured is that for the NFV infrastructure, we use NFV pods. The pods are a set of routers and switches and servers that are capable of serving given capacity of VNFs. And here they are assuming that the deployment, there is a need, there is a cost to deploy those parts in data centers, and we're assuming that cost to be around $64,000. And another assumption is about the hardware life of these, assuming it to be around five years so that we depreciate it accordingly. The way we handle the connectivity cost, generally, it varies, but then, you know, the representation of connectivity cost we have done is to use 20% of our revenue. Whatever revenue we make, 20% is incurred on connectivity cost. And the, the VNF licenses, the, the service, the software runs on, in a, on a server and across multiple sites, so we are assuming some redundancy is required in those, and we are at the redundancy percentage is assumed to be 10%. Now we will look at the assumptions on the customer base growth rate and the service attached growth rate. In the left-hand side picture, the traditional hardware-based solution is at the bottom, and the cloud-based solution uh, attached rates are at the top. Now, first we will look at the base growth rate. It is shown by the dotted line. It is a year-over-year -year growth rate. And for the traditional, it stops at 20%. For the cloud, the forecast is that it's marginally higher 
compared to traditional, and it comes to be around 25% by fifth year. And the forecast is a little higher for cloud CPE for many reasons, because cloud CPE offers such features like self-provisioning on a portal. Customers can come in and sign up on the court portal quickly. And they have the allure of quicker turnaround time. This is for provisioning. And then also for quicker time trouble resolution, because of automation and analytics, they can get quicker response time. And there is an ease and consistency of delivery. It is not manual. It is you know, automated. Hence, there is you know, consistency in that delivery. So all those features, with, because of all those, we believe that there will be a higher forecast for the attach rate of customer base. Now we will look at the base growth. Sorry, that was for the base growth rate of uh, customer base. Now we look at the attach rate of the customers. Now this is attach rate is the percentage of base that is subscribing each new services like firewall or IPS or antivirus. Now the colored lines reflect those attach rates for, now the orange one shows for the firewall and the pink line for IPS and the green line for antivirus service. Now we believe even those, they, for those attach rates, Cloud CPE has marginal higher value over five years. And we believe that is the case because there will be ability to run promotions. The marketing groups can run trial and error promotion, or trial and then subscribe promotions. And they can also cross sell and upsell based on the needs of the customer. They can offer all these promotions to those customers. And there will also be higher customer satisfaction. So all these factors will, will lead to higher attach rates. Now, a quick analogy here is to compare it against the Netflix service. Netflix initially started the service as a DVD mail-in option. They used to post it via USPS. Now, at some point of time, they realized there is value in the quicker delivery, instant delivery of their streaming service. Now, after many years, looking back, quicker delivery has taken is, is the main is, is the main component of the revenue compared to their DVD mail-in option. Now. How would you value this instant delivery of service? Do those assumptions hold good in your case? And that is something for you to ponder. And we also assume that the churn for cloud CPE, because of increased customer satisfaction, the churn will be higher. Sorry, the churn will be lower for cloud, higher for traditional. Now, the important thing is, are you know, do these? Are you seeing? I mean, are you? validating these assumptions. If not, we should be changing these assumptions, but these are the assumptions that drive the revenue side of the picture. So what does all those assumptions amount to for, in terms of revenue modeling? So as we see in the picture, the, in the chart, the cloud CPE represented by the orange bar comes out higher at the end of fifth. You know, by the end of all the five years, it comes out higher and much higher by the end of fifth year. So the three factors that contributed to revenue growth are lower churn for the cloud CPE, higher base growth rate, and higher service attach rate. And these are this happened because of the ability to have self-provisioning, increased customer satisfaction, and ease of marketing programs like try and buy, cross-sell, or upsell those features. And so all those three, these features drove these three factors, and these three factors contributed to higher revenue forecast for the next five years. Now we will look at the network operations costs picture. This is one of the most talked about features on the cloud CPE. First, we will look at what kind of benefits or rewards are we seeing from the operations cost. And then we will look at how or why we will get those benefits. Now, first of all, on the cost side, we expect that there will be, this is a very conservative estimate, we expect that there will be 55% reduction in the provisioning cost. This is the cost per site. We also expect that there will be around 31% of reduction in trouble resolution cost in the cost per site as well. Then the, in terms of cycle time, the agility factor that everybody talks about, we, are, we expect there will be a provisioning time reduction by around 53% that is equivalent to order to cash kind of metric. And then we expect that there will be time to resolve network events 
that cycle time will reduce by 80%. Again, these are this can vary greatly, but I still think this is a conservative estimate. Um, some of the industry participants have come out with a much higher benefits than this, so this is a very conservative estimate. Let's look at why we will see such kind of benefits. The reason is, in t when we look at the provisioning picture today, much of the order handling, the complete you know, completing the order, scheduling the resources, scheduling their time, and looking at the workflow management, so creating, identifying the hardware, committing the order to the system, preparing the billing, and setting up for billing, software licenses triggering, inventory management of equipment, and also management of supplier, identifying the install, installation requirements and the availability of technician. All of these are manual processes. And now, if you look at the service configuration, you need to have hardware and software configured. Truck roll has to be done. Network install. Security key exchange has to be done. Um, these are manual. Um, and then some of the processes like activation of equipment, line testing, IP address management, these are the factors that can be easily automated. And the next part is also about um, SLA management. Some service providers might have SLAs pretty stand off the shelf, and that may not that may be already automated today. But if they don't have, they have an agreement that needs to be done. You know, those will also take some manual steps. So not all of this can be automated, but some of these can be automated. So we believe, due to these reasons, the provisioning time as well as the cost will reduce by the factors just mentioned before. Now, if you look at the service assurance piece, which is the ongoing cost every month, every year, then there will be uh, in a fault and performance reporting kind of requirement and root cause analysis. All of these take time. And if we, the efficiency of use of resources and monitoring those and reporting and taking productive action, those will be manual steps. And in terms of managing the congestion, or even just the simple ticket flow management. These are some of the manual processes. Some of these, not all of this, some of this can be automated because of the automation scripts and also the flexibility and the analytics provides the ability to zero in on a network event quickly. And that's the reason why we believe some of these service assurance costs can be reduced as well as the cycle time. So do you believe this? Do you, how much of a factor do you think these will be in reducing your um, operations costs? That's something to, for you to consider and including, including your business case analysis. And also the other factor to look at is high availability uh, configuration will allow Cloud CPE to spawn a new instance if there is a trouble in one of the existing instances. So there will be served business continuity quickly compared to the existing methods. So how much of those factors will add value into our operations is something for you to think about. So the next picture is to look at the overall cost of the service. The left-hand side chart shows the cost of revenue per site per month. So how much will you incur every month to maintain a given site? So if you look at the, one of the key cost drivers for centralized CPE is that as opposed to hardware-based appliance where you put in a firewall or a CPE in a customer premise, it will incur hardware and the network function per, at a per site basis. But if you, you think about the centralized CPE or the virtual CPE, the, the, there is a shared software that runs in a data center. It can serve multiple sites. Not just, it, ha it doesn't have to be one site. It can serve multiple sites. So that means you can share one instance of software, one instance of license across many sites. So there you see there is a shared infrastructure, shared cost across sites. That will bring down um, cost not only for the software license, but also you need less number of har hardware devices compared to a, a traditional solution. It will also bring down the maintenance cost. Um, so you will see the CapEx reduction there. and. In terms of operation, we saw in the previous slide, you know, it brings out efficiency and productivity improvement. It will reduce the cost. So if you look at the, the bar graphs, each one of those components has shrunk up for the cloud CPE. However, we will also we will see two components, new two components appearing. One is for the SDN license, the other one for 
VNF license expenses. So that will increase the cost, but overall, as per cost of revenue per site per month, we will see reduction in, in the total cost. Now, remember that these costs per site is multiplied across many sites. In total, we will see a big reduction in the cost because of these factors. So what do those cost reductions imply to? It implies there is the margins are improved by it to a great extent. We are looking at the third year margin comparison, and all the margins you can see they are they have improved by a good extent. And the reason is because of the lower VNF license cost, or meaning that they are shared across multiple sites and improved network operations. So that is the improvement in profitability, and that can be seen in the p and statement. So what does all this improved profitability mean? So the improved profitability implies that you can in recover your investments sooner. So we will look at the valuation of our product or service. The chart on the left-hand side shows you know, the discounted cumulative cash flow comparing cloud in orange color against traditional appliance-based in blue color. So you will see that on uh, the beginning of third year, the recover the orange line cuts over the blue, implying that you, know, you can recover your costs from cloud CPE sooner, and you know, sooner than traditional, or if the break-even is around 3.30 or so, and the payback period, which implies that you will, you will recover all your money back by at the beginning of third year or so, approximately around 3.1 years. Now, this is a great way to compare how your project would compare against the traditional solution. You know, make a decision about alternative solutions by looking at the payback period, one of the metrics that is key in considering the uh, investment in alternative solutions. Now, if had we assumed the aggressive migration, instead of three years, had we made it like one year or two years, the picture would have been much, even improved even further. And also remember that we have been setting up infrastructure for additional services, and we have not included those services in the calculations. Had we included those, it would, the pictures you know, it would have been much more profitable um, than what we see. So the other way to evaluate that is to look at the real options value. We did not include that because we are already seeing improved benefits from here. And however, if we want that, we can continue uh, those calculations as well. Now let's. What are those? All the factors we considered so far with, were with the most likely scenario. We looked at. Now we will look at the risk assessment of those by looking at only one of the risk areas, which is primarily the key one, uh, looking at the demand risk. So, what if our assumptions about the market do not hold good? Um, so we consider three areas: high growth, like you know, in those scenarios, the churn will be uh, very low, and uh, the base growth rate and attached rates are double the rate and than the normal most likely that we saw so far. And in no growth scenario, we assume the churn will be very high, 250% higher. And then what if the base growth is, is zero and there is no growth of the customer at all and then there is no growth of the attached rate at, at all? So let's, I think the most interesting case is to look at the no growth scenario because we now, in the most likely scenario and in a high growth scenario, we will emerge out in a better way. But in the no growth scenario, as reflected by the right bottom corner chart, you see that the, the cost represented by the red line comes lower, comes out lower than the green line representing the revenue picture. So this is where the, the scenario where the number of sites or the number of customers are going down. That is represented by the blue bar. So you see that the cost still is lower than the revenue. And there is a point of inflection at year three. That's because of the migration assumption. Um, depending on the assumption, you know, we will probably see the red light coming out lower, even further, maybe in second year or maybe in fourth year, depending on how, how however long we assume that uh, migration is going to take. So even here, see, even in a no growth scenario, the risk may not be very high. This is something for you to consider and then see what is the risk in accepting Cloud CPE. 
it is possible to assess other model, other other risks as well. But we this is a sample uh, for a demand risk assumption. So this slide shows the summary of all the financials that we looked at based on the assumptions. The, the number shown here is they're all based on the assumptions we did. They, they look really good, 26% increase in revenue, 99% improvement in EBITDA, which is a synonym for operating cash flow, 94% improvement in operating income increase. Um, so these are the numbers we we see because on the assumptions we had, and also the payback period was 3.1 years. Um, so the financials are very attractive, but these are based on the assumptions. And remember, our assumptions were very conservative. We probably will see, I mean, it is quite possible that you can see much more benefit than our assumptions are, but we wanted to keep it very generalized across all kinds of carriers, service customers, and also across geographies, and also want to be very conservative in our estimates. So these are the benefits we see, and they look very good. And also the intangibles are also, you know, just to summarize those, with Cloud CPE, the operations are simplified, costs are reduced, the time, the cycle time is reduced. And the cost drivers were from sharing of licenses across sites, reduced network operation costs. So there is still time to capitalize on the first mover advantage, and it would be prudent to capitalize on those as long as, as, long as it lasts. Well, thank you, Shree, for that very insightful and really uh, a deep learning on the business impacts of uh, Cloud CP. I think this is something that our office reflect on their own. Now, with that, I'm going to hand it over to our guest uh, speaker from NEC, Ari, who will provide insights on the virtual CPE model for the enterprise segment. Thanks, Wayne and Shri. Um, I thought it was a fascinating uh, discussion on um, on the advantages of uh, virtual CP, especially when it comes to enterprise segment. Um, as we all know, that um, business segment is one of the most uh, profitable segment for service providers. It generates profits uh, significantly larger than in the residential segment. However, enterprise customers are much more demanding. Uh, they demand fast, seamless service delivery, ability to modify services to meet their needs much more easily and flexibly, and obviously the customization because of the requirements that they have, which are unique to some of the larger enterprises, makes it a little bit more challenging. Plus, uh, when you step into the business market, um, the service provider is not only expected to deliver unique customized services, but also maintain strict SLAs um, as mutually agreed with their business customer. The other um, complexity which uh, which creeps in when operators work with large enterprises is that they are geographically distributed branches, um, and then you know managing them, connecting them into one network um, that needs to be fast, needs to be easy, needs to be on demand. Um, so also the other end of it, when we uh, enterprises look for uh, workforce productivity, enterprise mobility as well as digital business approaches. They require a high level of security, as well as easy remote and secured access for their commercial data. So all of these requirements um, and meeting those requirements um, is a little bit more challenging when we look at uh, when operators try to use legacy hardware-based network infrastructure uh, for enterprises. Um, hardware-based customer premise equipment deployed at customer location um, you know, has higher touch point, as Shri pointed out. Um, it's costly from a support and maintenance standpoint, and obviously slow from a time to market as well. So in that context, uh, we think that the advantage of virtual CPE has really two major dimensions. One is around the revenue growth opportunity, from a time to market, adding new value-added services, quick onboarding, and upselling, cross-selling, obviously improving net promoter score, and so on but also a major OPEX benefits, which goes into cost reduction uh, based on uh, less truck rolls, um, engineers going to the um, manage, you know, troubleshooting standpoint, uh, much more automated and granular maintenance and support and streamlined operations. So 
as we look into our customer base, as we look at some of the initiatives that uh, NEC NetTracker is involved in, it seems like when it comes to virtualization, enterprise market is a big focus, and virtual CP seems to be the low-hanging fruit here. Uh, personalizing enterprise services has um, certain unique requirements when we look at larger enterprises who need much more customized offerings uh, built on um, a specific requirements, obviously high-value, geographically dispersed customers, versus when we look at the small and medium-sized business, which is uh, much more, um, uh, you know, much more bundled value-added services, uh, much more standardized, um, um, and so on and so forth. As we look at larger enterprises, um, the requirements that we hear from, from some of our customers, um, especially when it comes to their, their needs from, um, from the operators, and in, in terms of operators uh, who are our buyers talking to us about how can we provide a lot more you know, services which are based on SDN and FVs, such as cloud VPN, uh, WAN optimization, uh, network slicing, uh, bandwidth on demand, security services, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot more multi-country, multi-touch services, which uh, obviously the intent today with virtualization is that it's going to be much more self-service driven, much more on demand, much more automated, much more flow through. On the SMB side, slightly different because really we want to bundle value-added services with basic connectivity services, with the IT services, as well as network as a service on a common platform or a common cloud marketplace type of an environment. In that case, you need easy onboarding of services, uh, over-the-top content or over-the-top service, over-the-top um, vendors whom you can introduce and bring them as part of your portfolio. So if you think about it as we think about about three different dimensions. One is network as a service, obviously the infrastructure as a service, but also um, not just sort of software as a service, but also virtual network function as a service, all on a common cloud marketplace kind of environment. Um, operators can easily use that environment, white label that if they want to, and then start launching those services for the enterprise, uh, for the SMB segment. Keep on adding uh, via open APIs and via our or via the onboarding systems to be enabled and bring together different partners as they go along. Um, in that context, Sri, I had a question from you uh, for you. Uh, as you look at your customer base, and you, I know you touched upon enterprise and SMB in your part of the presentation, if you can talk a little bit about some of the unique requirements and unique challenges that you see when you look at the large enterprises versus the small and medium-sized business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I think with this SMB market, I think, you know, since they were not, you know, well taken care of in that regard, if we will, uh, it was not served well, I think. There is now a good potential for the carriers to go after this market. And, you know, I think it's not best basically uh, the connectivity services and the carriers that were offering VPN now can offer the managed security. And I think there's more and more need for the bandwidth and also security service. So I think, you know, offering the IPS, content filtering, anti-spam, uh, you know, those will be probably some of the very low-hanging fruits. And I also see with the carriers, you know, they are kind of now the smaller carriers, you know, they were limited to their region geography. I think this gives a great way to go after the geographical expansion, more going to multiple areas. And the services wise, um, you know, it increase the the larger providers, you know, they can probably go after with many different other traditional services because smaller businesses can be growing now. They can upgrade themselves too. And also related to that is what I also hear is some of the carriers are also interested in using the existing CPE. Um, you know, can we use the existing CPE to offer these services? They don't want to disrupt the existing setup for the customers so that you know, they don't incur the hardware cost. Maybe they can use the existing ones. So, so some of the thoughts from the market as I hear. So let's look at some of the revenue generation opportunities in, in, in a nutshell here. Um, as you can see, both enterprise SMB, both when we look at the axis of ARPU growth as well as churn management or churn decline, um, they have, there are different um, dimensions as well as different parameters. Um, so if we look at things such as a customized value-added service, for example, built on specific requirements of clients relevant for high ARPU segment, obviously that has got much more emphasis on the enterprise segment. This is where operators want to 
uh, customize it, make it much more uh, much more um, customer centric, make it much more unique uh, for the bigger customer requirements. Um, same holds true when we look at vertical solutions. Again, specific needs of the large value customer, the client, the industry, all of those plays a major role. When it comes to the newer VAS or you know over the top services, as I said before. Um, bringing it together as part of cloud marketplace, bringing it, making it available for the SMB segment uh, to deliver value-added services uh, from one or you know from a cloud kind of an infrastructure, uh, much more attractive when it comes to the SMB segment than um, than when it comes to enterprises. Um, obviously, enterprises uses some part of that, but there's a lot more customization. Whereas when it comes to the SMB, it's a lot more out of the box. You you add um, again. Um, you add, uh, you see where it goes, you measure, and then if you see that the traction is less for certain applications, etc., then you move on and you add more applications. So it becomes a lot more of a factory kind of an environment, um, and, and partner management, settlement, contract management, onboarding, all of those things become absolutely mission critical. Um, obviously, uh, when we talk about um, you know time to market, um, there's obviously a high impact on ARPU growth, both for large enterprises as well as SMB, uh, due to more additional days in billing cycle and client and client lifetime, um, all of those different aspects of things. Self-service capability, self-service portal, uh, absolutely becomes uh, critical when it comes to the SMB segment. But it's also very very important when we talk about enterprises and how they want to provide on-demand services to their end customers or the enterprise customers so that they are empowered uh, to make the configuration changes, the topology changes, add new, um, um, add new sites, as new zones, as, as new branch offices as, they, as and when they want it based on a multi-country basis if need be, um, but without having to go through different touch points or manual touch points, do a lot more of that, a lot more of that, uh, much more flow through or on a streamlined basis. Uh, remote main maintenance, obviously, um, uh, you know, it, it becomes very, very critical. When we talk about, um, you know, SMB segment, uh, remote troubleshooting with low incident, request resolution time, um, all of those may, plays a major role. Um, for large enterprises, obviously this is important to some extent, um, and it's critical from a self-service, et cetera, standpoint, but there is a lot more close cooperation and a lot more focus, a lot more attention from the CSP team uh, in pre present mode of operation uh, because there's a higher priority given to the contact center incident resolution time, better SLAs, et cetera, which operators provide to their high-value customers. So that part of it, um, uh, you know, even today is done quite well. Um, so um, that will change, but it's, it's something which is already there today. The time to market impact, um, especially when, it, uh, when we talk about deadlines around launching new services, um, change needs to change dramatically when we talk about the future mode of operations. And the promise of SDN NV is to make it happen. Um, if, we, if we think about legacy infrastructure and how things have changed when we, or, or, or the intent of change when we go into a virtual infrastructure kind of an environment, um, the promise um, or the goal for most operators to change it much more significantly. So the initial starting point for when when, uh, when operators want to launch services, um, especially when they now are talking about operators transforming into becoming a digital service provider, becoming an aggregator of services, becoming a retailer of services, um, you know, variety application, variety of services being launched uh, in a much quicker time frame is, the, is of essence here. And that's one of the major driving forces why operators are looking at SDN and NFV. So, um, you know, when we when we look at some of our uh, existing engagements, some of our POCs, some of our trials, some of our some of our deployments today, uh, we see um, more than you know huge amount of respondents. Um, in fact, most of the respondents are wanting the NFV SDN to reduce time to market, or from concept to deployment of new services, reduce the time frame drastically. Um, and obviously, launch of services or value-added services launched much more quickly um, increases revenue and increases and provides a fast mover advantage, uh, which all operators today that we are engaged with are looking at uh, very, very seriously. 
uh, be it um, consumer segment as, or when we look at enterprises, online challenge is, seems to be is in fact the most preferred entry point, and and makes sense uh, in many cases where you know people are fed up of calling the call centers, talking to ten different uh, engineering departments to make these services up and running, especially enterprises. Um, it makes sense um, that self service is has to be a precursor for for virtualization initiatives. So if you look at the present mode of operations where the client has to wait and then make the client call and to the call centers, it's more about client preferring online challenge going there from an activation standpoint, from an ordering standpoint, from a service modification standpoint, um, as well as from a, you know from a fault reporting and incident standpoint. All of these, from an operator standpoint, um, is very very important to have a proper self service channel in operation. It reduces average handling call time. It increases, if you have the right self-service in place, it reduces uh, the call to the call centers, um, increases net promoter score because you know, people are more satisfied when they can just go in and do it rather than having to call and being kept on hold for a longer time. And obviously, um, when we talk about average call handling time going down, um, calls coming to the call center reduced, there is a major impact of cost reduction or OPEX reduction. Um, in the next few slides, um, hopefully I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, from a setup, uh, from a maintenance, from a cross-sell and upsell standpoint, how does virtual CPE uh, brings in a lot of positive impact uh, to the operator community or to the enterprise customers. So if you look at from a customer connection standpoint, the typical process that an operator goes through is around pre-sales, project initiation, IT configuration, field engineer, IT post, and testing. At a very high level, these are the typical steps which, uh, which we see operators taking. Now, with virtual CPE, a lot of these, especially as when we talk about IT configuration, field engineering, post, and testing, a lot of these things uh, are compressed to a major degree. A number of truck roles are reduced. Um, time to set up new clients um, um, is also reduced because um, a lot of these uh, equipments um, are, are automated and, and you can do that from uh, remotely uh, to manage and configure some of those equipments. Um, and there's obviously an indirect impact of outgoing incoming calls because they decline. Um, because people go through self-service portal, they can do a lot of the stuff themselves. Um, so there's an overall um, a shrinkage when you talk about timing of setting up customer connections. Um, you know, the overall the cost reduction, it's, um, as well as um, the reduction of cost when it comes to the truck rolls, engineering rollout, and all of these things um, have a positive impact on the overall, um, you know, the revenue parameters of the balance sheet of the operator. As I mentioned before, um, Adding new services, new value-added services, especially for high-value customer, just makes it uh, makes a lot more economic sense for operators. Now, only thing holding them back was their infrastructure, and that it took a longer time to make these things happen. With virtual CP, um, the, the cross-selling and upselling kind of a thing, as well as adding value-added services, a lot of those things become a little bit, a lot more easier. Uh, because it's about adding new VNF, new services, uh, or value-added value service-related VNF into a cloud cloud environment and dropping that onto, um, you know, a CP or a virtual or a layer 2 box on um, uh, on a customer premise. just makes it a lot more easier. Uh, you don't have to use truck rules, so there's a major savings right there. And uh, overall, um, uh, change management um, as well as launching new services, adding new value-added services, the entire process becomes a lot more efficient, a lot more cost effective, uh, and obviously the velocity of service, that whole time frame, uh, increases in a, in, a, in, a, in a major way. Uh, that's a huge benefit when operators are looking at virtual CP solution, especially when they're looking at it from an enterprise segment standpoint. The other part is obviously something we, we kind of discussed before is around fault management or, or incident resolution. Uh, a lot of these things are 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 are, uh, are, are self healing to some extent. Uh, it's a lot cheaper uh, for these to be maintained, um, or virtual CP based environment to be troubleshoot or to be maintained. Um, number of calls, incoming calls, all of these parameters, which increases 
um, incident resolution costs for operators decrease. And as we see, the number of um, uh, the number of incidents decrease, as well as the number of the, the time frame to to close an incident or the number of channels that has to be touched from a call center standpoint. All of those decreases when you're talking about um, on, on, from a virtual CP kind of a solution. Um, there is the the support cost reduction. There is obviously the truck roll cost reduction as well. Um, and all of these things, again, becomes a major um, or, or a very crucial factor when we talk about uh, virtual CP. So it's not just, as I said before, it's not about just the, the activation time frame. Uh, it's not just about your adding value-added services or not just about incident resolution, but it's all of those together. And if you take all of those together and look at the benefits across them, uh, the business case uh, for virtual CP be it the consumer, be it enterprise segment, uh, becomes very, very profound. So if you look at a virtual CP, and I'm going to summarize some of the things that I just said, um, there are really four critical dimensions where, uh, where VCP benefits um, are, are, are major for, for operators. One is round, obviously around uh, meeting customer demands or their client demands launch, monetize, personalized services uh, much more quickly, much more faster, with lower touch, with uh, much lower touch point in a much more automated way um, becomes very, very critical. And that's one of the major benefits of virtual CP. Uh, new markets and new opportunities. So you can bring um, much more flexible business ecosystem with third parties or over-the-top players uh, on a revenue share-based model bringing together Office 365, for example, antivirus, and bringing together other solutions in a cloud-based environment where the CSPs becomes the hub or the aggregators for offering third-party vendor services to the end user. All of that becomes possible. Um, obviously, differentiating from competitors um, through much more agile on-demand service delivery, all of that becomes very, very critical. Um, when, we when we talk about revenue opportunities, the, the role uh, or the impact of uh, partner management, revenue management, settlement, contract management, all of the BSS things uh, becomes absolutely mission critical because at the end of the day, you, if you cannot bill or charge for your services, then it's really a hobby. So you have to be able to do that much more efficiently. Um, otherwise, commercialization um, you know, it does not really become possible. Uh, improvement in customer experience or client experience. Now, when we talk about remote troubleshooting capability, when we talk about self-service capability, faster time to market, all of these things um, really at the end uh, hits into the heart of customer experience. And, and when operators are now measuring themselves uh, on parameters such as net promoter scores uh, and then a few others, um, these are things which attributes, whether you are becoming um, uh, you know, uh, uh, having a positive net promoter score where people are um, basically um, not only, you know, becoming your uh, core customers, but also becoming your, um, you know, someone who um, proposes solutions or your services to the to their friends and others. So not just a, not just a user, but also an advocate. Um, and obviously operational efficiency, better workforce, better network utilization, both from a sales support IT team, all of that becomes important. Uh, being able to manage remotely so that you don't have to send uh, workforce on a regular basis or, or truck rolls on a regular basis, all of that uh, majorly adds to the bottom line for, um, for service providers. So VCP brings together much more benefits. A lot of that has been quantified when Shri talked about that. Uh, but these are the kind of benefits we see across the globe. And that's where we see a lot of uptake when we see uh, when virtual CP becomes the low-hanging fruit for me, most of the operators who are uh, embarking on an SDN and a V kind of a journey. So what does um, Juniper and NEC NetTracker uh, value proposition uh, as we bring to the table today? Um, I think uh, we believe that we are helping the service provider, the operator community across really four different dimensions. One is round process transformation, where we are helping operators moving to a future mode of operations, which is much more cloud-centric, uh, which includes hybrid network environment, um, and which includes all sorts of variations of, the, of, of cloud. 
uh, we also believe that we are helping operators to become much more agile, much more uh, provide services with much more velocity. So bundle any type of any type of services, such as be it transport CDN, virtual CPE, software defined WAN, all those different variations of services which operators are looking for, and having a smooth and streamlined um, uh, integration to service providers' IT environment, as well as providing the right solutions around OSS, BSS, catalog, partner management to make this all happen. Um, Business-defined architecture, uh, which is absolutely mission critical when we talk about large-scale commercialization of virtualization, um, service implementation with the high velocity, BSS, OSS adapters, and obviously cloud microservices-based, much more agile cloud-based architecture, which can be adopted for any of those operators' needs. And last but not the least, really is making, bringing together a one-stop shop, a, a cloud marketplace, which brings together uh, not only just your traditional um, network services, but it brings together cloud, network, IT, as well as your virtual network function as a service uh, in an in a, in a on-demand cloud kind of a marketplace. And obviously supporting full stack across the board, um, both from the NFVI layer or from the infrastructure layer up to the top layers, which includes um, um, your, your transport network, your your management and orchestration, your billing and OSS, CRM, catalog, etc., and obviously providing the single point of contact for the entire solution. So with that, when I would like to um, step towards the end of my presentation, so I would like to turn it over back to you. Well, thank you, Ari, for that deep insight on your perspectives around this virtual CPE journey. This really leads to how we conduct a collaborative journey to execute on this NFE transformation and ultimately how to collectively look at the business impacts that this will drive into your business. This transformation enabled by NFE is really a collaborative journey. We've talked about it with Sri and Ari today, where you need to bring different departments of the organization together, whether that be your operations staff, development, marketing, finance, as well as executive support around this. It needs to be worked together, first and foremost, to establish a vision. Where do you want to take this business, and how can NFE help you with that? Next is really around planning new services and a platform to be able to deliver that combined with the business case approach that Ari and Sri have gone over in great detail today. If you're very interested in this type of approach, contact us to learn about this more. We have programs specifically at Juniper to help our customers with this service delivery model. Next is really about bringing these capabilities out to market and driving the maximum customer interest in this new set of services that you have to offer. I hope you found this webinar interesting. It's provided a great amount of de detail on the business impacts. If you'd like to learn more about the NFE solutions, please visit Juniper's website on our NFE solutions page, as well as NEC Netcracker has a solutions page for their NFE offerings as well. I'd like to thank you today for taking the time. I hope you have found this truly educational and informative. And as well, a reminder to listen to some of our other webinars on different topics around technology and solutions, as well as organizational structures to help you with your NFE transformation.